Good morning again. Turn with me to First John chapter. First John chapter one. Let's begin uh, in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you again for this time. We worship you today. We know that your truth um, brings grace. We know that it is true, and we know that you are faithful to us. You have given to us your word. Use it today, I pray, to convict our hearts, to drive us to yourself. Encourage us with it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Last week, we began uh, with an introductory message uh, in 1 John. This is a new study for us, um, going through the book of 1 John. And uh, we're going to begin now by jumping right in, uh, one verse at a time. John writes in this letter uh, a rather compelling argument in these first four verses for Christian unity and Christian fellowship and Christian joy. And there really is a question that I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind through the message today, and that is the question, what produces Christian fellowship and what produces Christian joy? We see that the passage um, uh, answers this for us because we see two statements in particular here. Uh, and I'm giving you the partial statements, but I'm emphasizing the words, so that. And we see that these two statements from the passage say, so that you may have fellowship with us, and so that our joy may be complete. Something significant for John creates the fellowship and creates the joy, and we want to know what that is. In other words, what comes before the words, so that? Because whatever that thing is, we know that thing is producing the fellowship and is producing the joy. For us as 21st century Christians, we might concede the fact that fellowship and joy is elusive. Um, We might find ourselves sometimes feeling very alone in the world. And... uh, I would propose to us that contrary to what we may think the interconnectedness of the internet has actually not, in most cases, increased fellowship and relationship, but actually has served to drive them apart. Yes, we can talk to people on the other side of the planet, but many times it's done at the expense of the person on the other side of the table. And not only this, but it seems like many times we find our friends capitulating to the culture around us, and we find ourselves crying out, a faithful man, who can find? <laughs> where, where, where are they? And you might find yourself here today, I don't know, perhaps experiencing great hurt at the hands of others. Uh, Perhaps maybe you don't know if it's possible to trust anybody anymore. Uh, People constantly maybe let you down. You feel alone in this world with no fellowship and no joy. Where are we to turn if we want to produce this fellowship and this joy and this trust and this unity? The world would tell us and communicate to us, and actually modern evangelicalism as well, that in order to achieve greater heights of fellowship, we must shed more and more Christian distinctives. You want to have fellowship with someone? Then get rid of all of these Christian distinctives. We're told sometimes that we have to discard doctrine and truth. They would tell us that our fellowship and our joy can be increased by running away from truth. I'll give you an example of this. I was told uh, a few years ago by a member of our local ministerial association, he told me, John, the pastors in this group, we never discuss doctrine. We never discuss theology. Why? Because of the adage, doctrine divides. (laughs) 
Right? Doctrine divides. Because discussing the Bible openly could only lead to division. If this is what our pastors are saying in our community, is it any wonder why our churches, schools, community organizations, and government is where it is today? It actually is, in many cases, ironically, the pastors of our own community who are leading the charge and saying, let's not discuss the Bible. No, not here. No, not now. Let's set this aside because we want to have fellowship with one another. And we couldn't possibly have fellowship with one another if we talked about this. (laughs) This was also my experience a couple of years ago. Uh, when the pastors in our community called together a pastor's roundtable to discuss the issue of social justice. And I know some of you have heard me share this story before. But uh, the pastors in the group, we were all asked to define some terms so that we would agree on what we were talking about. And when it was my turn, I think I I quoted two Bible verses in the defining of, of what we were trying to do. And one of the pastors looked at me and kind of a condescending voice said, it sounds like you just wanted to find everything from the Bible. <laughs> and uh, I, I wish I had said, I apologize. I thought this was the Christian group. Let me go, let me go find the Christian group. Where, where, which room are they meeting in? Because <laughs> that's the one I'm supposed to be in. Um, I I would say this is also my experience in almost, I know that there are some, some good ones out there, but almost every parachurch organization that I've ever talked to, this is the same position. You can't quote the Bible here. You can't talk about the Bible here. We, we, you, it doesn't really mean what it says here. You have to be very careful about talking about Jesus. Let me establish something here. Contrary to popular opinion, fellowship and joy require more of Christ, not less of Christ. Okay? And we are out there, the world is out there saying, we can have more fellowship with, with these people if we just get rid of more Christ and get rid and less Christ here and less Christ there and less scripture and less of his word. Don't mention his name. Don't say any of those things. Because it's when we set all those things aside that now we can have fellowship with one another. Christ is Lord. Period. We are proclaiming sound doctrine to you so that we can be united, so that we can have fellowship, and so that we can have joy. You... Let me give you another example. You might recognize this progression in smaller, less significant ways, okay? Take your favorite hobby. I don't know what it is. Um, Competitive stone skipping, okay? (laughs) And nobody does that. So you're sitting at a basketball game, and all of a sudden you find out the person next to you is also into competitive stone skipping, okay? (laughs) What all of a sudden you're like turning your chair towards them, we have a lot to talk about, and you're excited, and you're like, there's another person on the planet who likes this, okay? Okay, take take your you've experienced something like that before, right? Where it's like, oh, you're interested in this too. Now let's of course take that in perhaps a um, more serious way. You're sitting on an airplane. And, you know, you're putting in your earphones or whatever, and you're just ready to conk out for the flight. And all of a sudden, you find out that the person next to you is a Christian. And suddenly, instead of it being like, I'm sitting next to this stranger, it's like, I'm being united with a long-lost brother. And it's like, there's so much joy that we have. There's so much. Because... We both believe the same things about Christ, and we both know the same Christ, and we both love the same scripture, and the more that we have in common in Christ, the more joy and more fellowship that we have. That's what this passage is talking to us about today. I'm going to use the following outline. Um, I almost didn't do an outline today because John has... um, John, John has an interesting way of, uh, of arranging the topics here in, in 1 John. Um, in some ways, I think, has perhaps 
frustrated commentators because it's like, just give me the outline. And John has a tendency to kind of go in this spiral pattern. And he talks about a topic and then talks about another topic and another topic. And then he comes back to the topic he was talking about before. And it's like, you can't put together this strict outline because the moment that you think he's done talking about this topic, he comes back and talks about it again. And so you're like, what are we going to do here with this? And so I'm kind of holding this outline loosely. Um, there, there's a lot of overlap here and going back and talking about the same thing, but for purposes of, of what we're doing here, this is uh, probably the best outline I, uh, I, could, I could come up with, and that is theology explained, verses 1 through 2, theology proclaimed, verse 3, and then theology manifested. 1 John 1, 1 through 4, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ, and we are writing these things to you, so that our joy may be complete, or full. Now, here at the outset, we have a prominent feature of 1 John that we have discussed in the introductory message last week, and that is that John is arguing against a false Christology. Christology is just a fancy word for uh, theology about Christ, uh, doctrine about Christ. The early Gnostics, we said, were claiming that Jesus Christ could not possibly have come in the flesh because flesh is bad and spirit is good. And so he existed in eternity past with God the Father in spirit form. And you're telling me that he would come and put on human flesh? That's the most repulsive thing we could ever think of because Gnosticism. Gnosticism says that the physical is bad and the spiritual is good. They were teaching that Jesus Christ only seemed or appeared to come in the flesh. He wasn't really physical, but he kind of looked physical. So then with that background and that cultural context in mind, you can now see where John is going here and how he carefully crafts his statements to combat this false Christology. He takes a lot of care to express that Jesus was on this earth as a physical person. He refers to three senses. He says that we have heard, seen, and touched, describing the physical attributes of Christ. And so you understand that this passage then and this book was written in particular in order to combat heresy, to combat false doctrine. False doctrine was already coming into the church this early. There was a false teaching about Christ, a false Christology, and John is writing in order to refute this false Christology. And he does this by establishing the humanity of Christ. Now, we note that he says that this is from the beginning. We'll see a little later that he's talking about Christ here specifically. But that which was from the beginning could be a reference to Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created, and then also to John 1-1. In any event, this establishes the fact, when he says this is from the beginning, he is establishing the fact that this is nothing new. We're not teaching you anything that's new. As we've said before, uh, when it comes to theology, when it comes to theology and doctrine and truth, innovation is not welcome here. That which was from the beginning, that which has always been the case. Certainly our understanding of doctrine grows, certainly our understanding of scripture grows, Certainly throughout redemptive history, God reveals more and more of his truth, but it always was true and always is true, and it's not innovative in that way. We don't make up new things as we go along. 
That which we have taught to you is that which is true from the beginning. But given the reality that there's not a lot of people, there are some, but there's not a lot of people today that are trying to make the same exact argument that John's opponents were, what are we to make of this passage for us today? Fair question. And I think one of the, one of the primary applications, we talked about this a little bit at the 9 o'clock hour, one of the primary applications we can take away from knowing that Christ has come in the flesh is we can take away the application that the transcendent God is imminent. In other words, he is with us. There's a certain kind of comfort that comes from knowing that Christ has come in the flesh. That he would walk alongside of us. That he would be with us. That he would not just be so far removed that we can never... But he is a high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. In Matthew 1 and verse 23, we read, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. That which we have seen and heard and touched. You can look at 1 John 1 and recognize that God is with you, that Jesus Christ is with you. And this brings comfort to every believer because no matter who has let you down in this life, no matter what trouble you have had, no matter whether you feel all alone or not, you have Christ. And he's sufficient. At some point or another, every human being in your life will let you down in some way, big or small. Okay? I will let you down. Okay? Probably let all of you down already. <laughs> Your spouse will let you down. Your friends will let you down, okay? Your re- Who do we have? We have Christ. He never changes. He's with us. In order to understand the level of comfort that this brings, you say, God with us, okay, that's fine. Think back to when you were a child, okay? When it was dark outside, you don't go into the basement, right? I mean, that is, that's when all the monsters come out, okay? And they're all waiting down there to grab little kids who come down to the basement, right? That's what you're thinking, right? I could never go down in the basement, right? But suddenly... If your dad is holding your hand, you're skipping and you're singing all the way down the stairs. No matter if it's dark in there. Because what? He's with you. There's a certain comfort. Like, you're not even thinking about being scared anymore because they're with you. Or if you find yourself alone in the woods at night. Some of you adults (laughs) find yourself alone in the woods at night. You're, you're a kid and you're in the, in the woods at night, right? But if your parent is with you, oh, it's fine. We got a mile hike back, but that's fine. He's here. He's with me. It's all good. The Christian parallel to this is Psalm 23 and verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And just like the child who's afraid of the dark finds comfort even if the parent doesn't say anything, if the parent doesn't, just the fact that the parent is with them, so too the Christian finds comfort knowing Christ is with me. That which we have seen and heard and felt, he, he's with us, Emmanuel, Christ with us. We can thus go to 1 John 1 and recognize that Christ coming in the flesh means that Christ is with us, and no matter what we go through in life, we can have that assurance and that hope. John also gives us this assurance in his gospel in John 14, 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Christ promises his followers that he will always be with them, that he will not leave them, and that he will not forsake them. This truth comes to us, it comes to the forefront in 1 John 1, where we learn that God is not just above us, and removed from us and distant from us, although he is above us in the sense of his holiness. But he's not above us in the fact that I can't be bothered 
with, with their chaos down there. I, I couldn't possibly, I have more important things to do. 1 John 1 tells us that he's near to us. Take comfort then in knowing that Christ is with you if you're a believer. This brings us to verse 2, which says, The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. This really expands on the previous verse. There are a couple of noticeable or notable features here. First, we see that the life was made manifest. This indicates to us what we have been assuming all along, and that is this passage is referring to Christ. What was made manifest? Well, it was Christ in the flesh. This life was made manifest. It was presented to us in the flesh. We also see another feature here is that this life or this Christ was proclaimed. Men preached. John the Baptist preached of his coming and his disciples preached. And after his death, he was preached and proclaimed. This means, and we'll see this more in a moment, that Christ was not hidden. Take note of that for just a minute because that's another feature of Gnosticism. This is actually, I think, John giving a subtle jab to this early form of Gnosticism. Why? Well, one subtle jab to it is he's in the flesh and there's nothing bad about that. The other subtle jab is another feature of Gnosticism, and that is the Gnostics loved what they would um, talk about as a hidden truth or hidden meaning. And he's presenting the opposite of that here, isn't he? Christ was made manifest. Christ was proclaimed. He wasn't hidden. You don't need to have a special insight to understand this Christ. Um, I remember seeing a, a television show when I was a kid um, about the Bible code, okay? I'm going to just tell you right now so you're not wondering as I'm explaining this. This is bad stuff, okay? <laughs> Is John endorsing that? No, I'm just going to tell you right now, no, okay? Um, they, they take the Bible and they lay it out in like a crossword puzzle, and they claim that it predicts things about the future. So I'm going to show you part of the Bible code here. Um, they've got it laid out in Hebrew, and this is what they would do. And then they would tr- like draw diagonal lines and horizontal and vertical lines, and they would say, well, there's makes words. And so in this one, uh, it's twin towers, it knocked down twice airplane <laughs> in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, this is the Bible code, okay? Again, I'm going to reiterate nonsense, okay? This, this is actually a modern form of, of a Gnostic tendency, okay? Because what Gnostics thrive in is hidden knowledge, is hidden meaning. And so they say, we've got all these academics together, we've done all this research and all this study, and we have the wisdom and we have the key to unlocking all the secrets. And you have to come to us so that we can tell you what these are. And you could be wise like us if you want to, but this is not apparent to the normal average person. You have to have all these skills. By the way, um, you can actually do this in Moby Dick too. Um, People have done that with that book and they've predicted all kinds of things. Um, If you have a big enough thing like this, you can make any word you want, okay? (laughs) And this is what's going on here with, with this Gnosticism. You are claiming that there is a hidden knowledge and that certain intelligent people have insight on how to decipher it and how to understand it. Okay. Notice what John is doing. He is giving the exact opposite of what the Gnostics thrived in. He could, have, he could have, you know, what they wanted to hear was, well, there's a secret thing here, and you didn't understand that this uh, represents this, and, and, and uh, uh, allegorically speaking, the donkey here represents this, and, and all. that's what they wanted to hear. And he simply says, um, let me just tell you guys something. Christ was made manifest, and he was proclaimed. There's nothing hidden there. Here's what we have to rejoice in today as Christians. That God does not encrypt his word. It's just here. It's just available. It's just readable. Um, 
stop. Why? Why? Just read what he gave to us. Just read it. Christ is made manifest. He's proclaimed. And that's really kind of a segue into this next section here. And that is in verse 3 where we read that this theology is proclaimed. Not only is theology explained. Okay, let me correct your bad Christology. He was he, you know, he was, he was manifest, he was, uh, we've seen and, and heard and touched, and I'm explain to you and correct your bad doctrine. Now we're going to proclaim this theology. And in verse 3, he says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Now this is where things get a little interesting, and John starts to draw some lines together, and he says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim. That is, they have proclaimed Christ. And the interesting part here would be the words, so that. He links two things together. He links a proclamation of Christ, a preaching of Christ, evangelism, preaching the gospel. He takes that thing and then he takes fellowship over here. And in the middle, he puts so that. He links all of these things together. So let's read the first part of that verse again. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. We proclaim to you. We proclaim that which we've seen and heard. The thing that we saw and heard, namely Christ, we proclaim to you so that you might have fellowship with us. You see the line there? So modern evangelicalism says this. This is is where the introductory uh, discussion comes into play. Modern evangelicalism says essentially this. We want to have fellowship with you. We want to have fellowship with all of you people. So let's stop proclaiming truth and let's minimize doctrine. In other words, we don't talk about theology here because we want to have fellowship, obviously. (laughs) You, You see how that's going counter to everything that John is talking about here? This is the exact reverse from the passage in front of us. Here's what John is saying. Here's what John is saying. This is the message of what he's saying right here. We want to have fellowship with you. We long to have fellowship with you. And so that's why we're proclaiming the truth to you. That's why we're proclaiming doctrine to you. That's why we're proclaiming Christ to you. Because we know that the way to have fellowship with one another is to have Christ in common is to know the truth about Christ. In other words, we can discard the popular expression, doctrine divides, and replace it with the more biblically robust and opposite expression, doctrine unites. That's what he's saying. It's exactly what he's saying here. And this is not the only place we see this in Scripture. 1 Peter 3.8 Finally, all of you have unity of mind. Get on the same page about truth and be united in mind. 1 Corinthians 1.10, he also says this. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you and that you be united in the same mind. This is a rather straightforward idea here. You have a coworker or someone you know in the community, a friend or someone, and you say, I long to have good, solid, deep fellowship with him or her. I long to have fellowship with this person. You know what the next thing you say is? I'm going to preach the gospel to them. Because we can go deeper in our fellowship with people when we have Christ in common when we preach the gospel to them, when instead of dispensing truth, we actually go deeper into truth. And that is exactly what the passage is saying. We've proclaimed the gospel to you. We are proclaiming this message to you so that for the purpose of, in order that we might have fellowship with you. 
And one of the joys that we see here is that this fellowship extends beyond horizontal fellowship. It goes vertically as well because he says this fellowship extends to the Father and to the Son. Do you see that in verse 3? And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. There is something about enjoying the same things with others that increases joy Specifically, in particularly, there is something about enjoying the same Christ that increases our fellowship with one another. We want that in our own community. We want to fellowship and share the same gospel truth with everyone in our community. Wouldn't it be nice if every interaction in our community was like that airplane interaction? Oh, you're a believer? <laughs> You're at the store, or you're with your coworkers. Oh, you know Christ too? (laughs) What's increasing? Fellowship? You know what else is increasing? Joy. That's what the final verse says. You, you, You get the joy thrown in too, as part of the deal. Here we read this. We are writing these things to you so that our joy may be complete. Now, some manuscripts say so that your joy may be complete, and actually this is uh, a little bit uh, tricky because um, a lot of good manuscripts will go in either direction here. Um, And I I would actually say we can deduce elsewhere from Scripture that both are true. Uh, Increased fellowship leads to increased joy for everyone all around. Okay, I want to read to you what Uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote on Christian joy. He says, Joy is something very deep and profound, something that affects the whole and entire personality. In other words, it comes to this. There is only one thing that can give true joy, and that is contemplation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He satisfies my mind. He satisfies my emotions. He satisfies my every desire. He and his great salvation include the whole personality and nothing less. And in him, I am complete. Joy, in other words, is the response and reaction of the soul to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is this not what the passage in front of us is saying? He starts off by saying, you guys have your Christology all wrong. Let me correct that for you. This is who Christ is. And oh, by the way, the reason that I'm correcting this for you and teaching you the truth about Christ is because we want to have fellowship with you. And we know that the result of this fellowship is going to be increased joy all around. The more that we know and cherish Christ and the more that we find others who know and cherish Christ, the more that we have fellowship and the more that we have joy. This passage is saying that it is this Jesus, the one who was made manifest, the one who was proclaimed to you, he is at the center of Christian fellowship and Christian joy. Joy is not a thing, therefore. Joy is a person. And all joy radiates outside of Christ as that center. Right? Is there any joy that's is there any joy that skirts around Christ and I can have joy apart from Christ in this scenario? You can enjoy a sunset and you enjoy it through Christ. Look at what Christ has done with thankfulness. Did you know that looking at a sunset, your joy will be increased? if you receive that with thanksgiving? Did you know that eating a thanksgiving meal, you could enjoy that apart from Christ, but when you enjoy that with thanksgiving and gratitude towards Christ, and you thank him for that provision, and you thank him that, God, you are the kind of God who not only gave me desires, but you are satisfying those desires, the joy increases. Everything, sunset, apple pie, baseball, 
campfire, the duties of caring for a home, responsibilities that God has given us, everything is enhanced when we know that Christ is the center of it all. It is for him, through him. Christ is the center of it all. So we're going to say this proposition, okay? I'm going to give you a proposition. If you do not know this Christ, you cannot have full joy. You can't. Do you see now why knowing the truth is so important to your joy? See why he started? You see why he went and weaved the way that he did through this passage? We got to start here. You got to have right Christology. You got to know Christ. You got to know the right Christ. You got to be worshiping the right Jesus. You got to know who he is. And as we go and we move further in, we have greater delight in this Christ. Knowing Jesus Christ is essential to our joy. Why do we preach the gospel? Well, um, so there's a primary reason. We do it for the glory of God. That's primary. But there is a secondary reason, and that is we preach the gospel for your joy. I want these people, my coworkers and community, to have joy. I want them to have fellowship. I want them to, to, to have satisfying lives. I don't want them to chase around for, for a, a kind of joy that comes from, they chase around materialism and chase around this and chase around that and say, maybe this will give it, maybe this will give it, maybe this will give it. I want them to have full joy. I want, pastorally speaking and personally speaking, I want your joy to be full and complete. I get it. Life is hard. And it throws us curveballs. And, and, and some of us struggle through things. And I realize that for some people, it may be a very long path ahead to try to figure out how do these things all apply. But I just want to say in very broad terms that Christ is your joy. And he's at the center of that. And run to him. So where do we go from here? Um, I just want to give kind of, uh, as we close here, three points of application and the first one is rejoice that the gospel is manifest and was proclaimed to you, okay? This one kind of um, comes r- really straight from the passage that, that, that he was made manifest and proclaimed. But the, the feature here to note is that God did not hide this wisdom and this revelation. It's plainly written on the pages of Scripture, uh, you don't have to have a doctorate. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be any of those things. Uh, the plowboy can read and understand what the gospel is. The child can repent and believe on Christ and be saved. Uh, the gospel was made accessible. It was not hidden. That's the first point of application. The second point is that we are to rest in Christ knowing that he's with us and that he's sufficient for our joy. No matter what you've experienced, no matter who has abandoned you, no matter who's let you down, Christ will not. Um, Maybe it feels like he has, but like we talked about at 9 o'clock, having that instrument panel. It feels like I'm banking to the left, but I'm really, my instrument panel says I'm actually banking to the right, and so I'm going to go by what my instrument panel says, okay? Feels like... Christ has forsaken you, but correct that. Do a course correction by looking at Scripture. I'm gonna, I know it feels this way. I know I'm thinking this, 
but I'm just going to believe what the Bible says. That's rather straightforward. And then the third point of application <clears throat> is that we are to proclaim Christ. Right? Doesn't that come right out of this passage? We proclaimed him to you so that we could have fellowship and joy with you. And so what's our application? Proclaim him so that we can have fellowship and joy with people. Again, this is not, I don't think this is the primary reason for evangelism. I think that's the glory of God. But I think as a secondary reason, uh, we are to proclaim to increase joy uh, all around. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your grace to us. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for the increased joy and increased fellowship that we can have with one another and with you because of this gospel message. I pray that you might help us to seek to know Christ more. I know that it can be oftentimes very uh, confusing and hard, and and there are many things going on here. We may find ourselves uh, even saying, yeah, I I think I know Christ, but, but I still find that there's struggles in this way, and, and we know that your word has answers to these things. And we haven't dived into the specific answers, but just the very broadly speaking, we know that we can connect a deep abiding joy with Christ. And so we pray that you might help us to internalize these realities. Help us, those who may be struggling through these kinds of things. I pray also that you might help us to be bold, to preach the gospel in, in its truth, We would not withhold parts of the gospel, that we would not obscure it or encrypt it because of fear of man, but that we would simply boldly proclaim it, knowing that you give us increased fellowship and increased joy, we pray in Christ's name.